Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. It's hard to believe it's 2021. I've told the story a number of times that um, I remember being a kid, Joseph's age, the age of many of you, uh, young ones, and calculating how old I would be in the year 2000. And for the record, 36. That's how old I was in the year 2000. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, wow, 36. I can't imagine being 36. And that's just so far in the past. <laughs> just blew right past that. But here we are, not only the year 2000, but the year 2021. Uh, it's just like the Bible says, isn't it? Life is like a vapor. It's here for a moment and it vanishes away as time continues to race by. Um, just one other little word of introduction here. Uh, last, last weekend, last Sunday, Denise and I uh, stayed home. One of our sons who was with us looked to us to be the poster child for COVID. And uh, so to be cautious, we ended up staying home. And to finish that story, uh, turns out he tested negative for COVID and four of us in the family all tested negative. So apparently it was something other than COVID. But uh, anyway, we had the opportunity to tune in to Twitch, which I hadn't done in a while. And I was just so impressed. And um, the, the kids who were with us were, were impressed. And uh, one of the things I was impressed with that I didn't experience the last time I was on Twitch was the, um, the app that's available uh, through the, the uh, Apple I, I, App Store, sorry. Maybe there's one for Android too, but it worked so slick. I downloaded the Twitch app on my phone and connected right away, and then it cast from my phone to our TV, and it was just wonderful. And when I can get technology to work, it just thrills me. <laughs> so I continue to be thrilled. So uh, thanks once again to our brothers who have worked so hard on our streaming ministry. Well, we're uh, in a new year. Pastor Daniel preached last Sunday, really a New Year's message. And so we're uh, moving on in our studies through the book of Acts. So we're in Acts chapter 24, and it turns out that this passage also lends itself to a, a New Year's-y kind of theme, and so that's how we're going to, to look at it. But uh, um, let's read the passage together in Acts chapter 24, verses 22 through 27. Acts 24, verses 22 through 27. But Felix, this is the, the Roman provincial governor, Felix, in whose custody the apostle Paul was at this particular time. Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, that is Christianity, put them off, saying, when Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with, with his wife, Drusilla, who is Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So, as I uh, mentioned, we're going to approach this text with sort of a New Year perspective in mind, and uh, just cutting to the chase, letting you know where we're going to go. These three New Year's resolutions for two, uh, 2021 have a lot to do with verse 25, 
when we're told that Paul reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. But uh, we're going to do the text justice and uh, do due j- diligence in terms of studying through it exegetically. Uh, so let's first of all look at the background and uh, this will give us an opportunity to, to review a little bit since it's been a few weeks since we've been in the book of Acts. So Acts chapter 24, verses 22 uh, and following. I would just remind you that uh, we find ourselves here at the end of Paul's third missionary journey. And just by way of a uh, reminder, uh, he took off on that jer- missionary journey from his home church in Antioch, went through South uh, Western Asia here uh, into Europe, Greece, and then back down again, took the, southern, the southerly route, and he was in a hurry uh, to go from Troas to Jerusalem so that he can be at the temple in time for the, the Feast of Pentecost. And you'll notice that's where his missionary journey ended because he ended up getting arrested. And it could be argued that really that's where his fourth missionary journey began, his missionary journey being under arrest, uh, because it continues that way. Paul continues to be under arrest until his, his death. And then by way of reminder and background, uh, Paul was arrested in the temple in Jerusalem, and then he appeared before the Roman tribune, who is later identified to us by Luke as Claudius Lysias, and that's in Acts 22, verses 1 through 29. Then he appeared before the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 30, and on into chapter 23. And the the Sanhedrin was arguing for his death, remember. They were out for Paul's blood. Then Paul was uh, sent by the tribune Claudius Lysias to Governor Felix in Caesarea. And um, here's a lay of the land. Here's Jerusalem. Here's Caesarea. That's about a 62-mile journey, and remember, by foot. And having arrived in Caesarea and appearing before Felix, uh, Paul was accused by uh, Tertullus, this lawyer who was serving the needs of the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 24, verses 1 through 21. And that brings us up to where we are today. Uh, Paul was kept in custody in Caesarea. And uh, let's look at verses 22 and 23 once again. So Felix, as I mentioned, uh, this is a a Roman provincial governor. This is the one that the uh, uh, Roman tribune uh, submitted to, he did help from. And this Felix, we're told, after hearing uh, Paul being accused by the Jews, Tertullus, and then after hearing Paul's defense, and they're completely different, They're completely opposed to each other. Luke tells us uh, that this Felix having a rather accurate knowledge of Christianity. So Paul, uh, Paul, Felix was exposed to the message of the gospel, probably through his wife, Drusilla, that we're going to hear a little bit about later on. But he, he put them off, meaning he wasn't ready to make a decision. He wasn't ready to render a verdict one way or the other, but he was going to wait for the Roman tribune, Lysias, uh, to come to Caesarea. So he says, when Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. And then he gave orders to the centurion that, he should be, that Paul should be kept in custody, but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. And that was fitting because Paul was a Roman citizen, so he did have rights, not the kinds of rights that we as Americans enjoy and take for granted sometimes, uh, 
but he did still have rights as a Roman citizen, and he had not been convicted of a crime. He was accused, and uh, he was accused of crimes that would have warranted the death penalty, but still he was not convicted, but he was, uh, uh, he was under arrest with some privileges. So that's the background leading up to the heart of the passage, which is really Paul's message to this Felix. So notice in verse 24, after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was, a, uh, who was Jewish. She was a Jewess. This uh, woman has a very interesting backstory all by herself. Um, she was married at the age of 14. And it was all about manipulation and privilege and uh, politics. But she was married when she was 14. And by the time she got married to Felix, which was her third marriage, she was 16. So she was a Jewish woman, but not godly. She was a Jew in name only, maybe, maybe we would say. But still, she was familiar with Judaism, and she was familiar probably with this sect of Christianity uh, that a lot of people considered to be just a sect of Judaism uh, that was nicknamed The Way, and so Felix probably heard about Christianity from his young Jewish wife. But anyway, Felix sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. So Felix was not completely dismissive about Paul's case and especially Paul's message. And so privately, he actually called for Paul. He wanted to hear what Paul had to say. He wanted to learn more about the way that Paul represented from Paul himself. And it, it presented this incredible providential opportunity for the gospel to Paul. And it was an opportunity that Paul seized. And so Paul gladly went before Felix and spoke to him about faith in Jesus. But now notice in verse 5, when um, Paul spoke to Felix and to Drusilla about faith in Christ Jesus, what did Paul say? And right here, a lot of contemporary evangelists would, would say to this crowd, to Felix and Drusilla and anyone else who may have been there, they, they would have said something like, I'm here to tell you about the love of Jesus. And Jesus definitely loves the world. He loves his people. He loves the church. He loves his bride. He loves his sheep. But that's not what Paul talked about. A, a lot of people would say, if given an opportunity like this, let me tell you about this wonderful plan that ga God has for your life. That's also not what Paul said. That wasn't his method of sharing about faith in Christ Jesus. Instead, Luke tells us that Paul reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. And I, I just hope that sinks into you before we look at what these things mean in more detail. I hope that sinks into you that when given an opportunity to speak about faith in Christ Jesus, this is what the apostle spoke about. Not what so many modern day evangelists do. But this is what faith in Christ Jesus entails as far as the Apostle Paul was concerned. So let's look at each of these things. He reasoned, first of all, about righteousness. 
Righteousness means integrity, virtue, purity in life, uprightness, correctness in thinking, feeling, and acting. The, the, the word righteous in the English, uh, in the Old English, was actually derived from the word right wise. Right wise. And the whole point is just absolutely right. Being in a position, living in such a way that is just right. And especially in the eyes of God. That's what righteousness is. Just rightness, right wiseness. And what does righteousness have to do with the Christian message? Why would Paul start here when he's sharing with this pagan Roman provincial governor about faith in Christ Jesus. Well, let's look in the next book over, the book of Romans, that was written by this very Apostle Paul to understand that. Romans chapter 1. Look with me at verse 16. The Apostle Paul wrote here, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's a pretty well-known passage. But notice what he says next in verse 17. For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul says that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, this is very important because here Paul is talking about the righteousness of God and not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of God and not stuff that we do, right wise stuff that we do. And this incidentally was very instrumental in the, uh, the conversion of the great reformer Martin Luther, who preached, uh, he lectured through the book of Romans when he was a professor of theology uh, at the university in Wittenberg, but he was an unbeliever. And uh, when he got to this passage, it just gripped his heart and he realized, wow, here I'm dedicating myself to establishing my own righteousness, but the gospel is all about the righteousness of God. And then God ended up using that to save Martin Luther. But once again, Paul says that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And let me just say that that's why righteousness is the right place to start. Because no matter how good you may think that you are, the Bible says, by the way, there's none good, no, not one. But no matter how good and righteous you might think that you are, your righteousness cannot measure up to the righteousness of God. And the righteousness that we as believers receive through faith in Jesus in the gospel is none other than the very righteousness of God. So it's a great place to start. But Paul doesn't end his uh, theology, if you will, his doctrine of righteousness with the righteousness of God. Notice how he continues in verse 18. For the wrath of God, the, the anger, the judgment of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness 
and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And I believe, and a lot of other Christians believe, that today's gospel tends to make a beeline to the love of God without addressing the matter of human sinfulness. And that's what Paul is elaborating on here. On the one hand, he's told us about the righteousness of God, but now on the other hand, he's telling us about the unrighteousness of sinful mankind. That's why we need the righteousness of God, because we are by nature unrighteous. We are the opposite of right, the opposite of godly, the opposite of holy. And we tend to live our lives that way, even suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. That means holding down what God has revealed to us to be the truth because we're so committed to our sin. We would rather go on living in sin than submit ourselves to the truth of the gospel of God's grace. That's how perverted the carnal mind is. That's how much in sin we are by nature. So, we're unrighteous when God demands righteousness. And then, flip another page or two over to chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. Notice what God does for us in the gospel. And, and it once again has to do with the righteousness of God. Verse 21 of Romans chapter 3. But now... The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And just a quick summary, God does not call sinners like us who are desperately wicked and alienated from him to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps, turn over a new leaf, and start living righteous lives. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is we need to acknowledge how sinful and unrighteous we are by nature and receive the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ as a free gift. That's the gospel. Then, as a result, live a righteous life. And that's where the story of righteousness continues. So look with me. We're in the book of Romans. Look at the end, towards the end, chapter 14 and verse 17. Romans chapter 14 and verse 17 where the, the same apostle writes, for the kingdom of God, and that is where we are as believers. That's our residence. That's our citizenship. Jesus is our king, and we are citizens in the kingdom of God as believers. Paul says that realm of the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's so interesting that Paul says here that the kingdom of God, which is where we live as we believe in Jesus, as we follow Jesus, as we trust in Jesus, first and foremost, that kingdom is a matter of righteousness. In other words, as we follow King Jesus in his kingdom, we're supposed to be about the matter of righteousness. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. Just because 
We are unrighteous by nature and cannot satisfy God because of our total depravity. Just because we can't save ourselves, just because our salvation is not the result of works, does not mean that then righteousness is not important for us. In fact, that righteousness is what God has called us to. He has saved us from unrighteousness to righteousness. And just to hammer that point home, here's our last text dealing with righteousness. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 9 through 11. The same person, Paul, who reasoned to Governor Felix about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, wrote this. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And just pause there. So a lot of well-meaning Christians who understand the doctrine of justification by faith alone, sometimes look at that verse and conclude that what Paul is talking about, once again, is the righteousness of God by which we're justified through faith alone in Christ alone. But that is not what Paul is talking about. He's not talking about justifying righteousness. Again, the righteousness of God, which we cannot achieve. He is talking about practical righteousness in our lives. Because notice what he says, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. These are matters of righteousness versus unrighteousness. And Paul says, don't be deceived. Those who live characteristically unrighteous lives are not going to heaven. The, the notion of the gospel that you can be saved and have faith in Jesus and yet go on living an unrighteous life is deception. It's not the biblical gospel. It does not represent faith in Christ Jesus. This is not the way that the apostle Paul and the apostles preached. It's a lie. And then Paul says in verse 11, and such were some of you. It's not that Christians are holy by nature. It's not that we're any better than anybody else. But God in his mercy rescued us from our sin, even when we were helpless, even when we were his enemies, even when we loved our sin. But God saved us. And notice the terms that Paul uses. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were made holy. You were born again by the Spirit of God. And he adds, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And justification there does refer to to us to be, uh, being declared righteous in the sight of God because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. But notice that the two things go together. Sanctification, our being made holy in practical righteousness, and justification. The two are different, but always together. Whoever is justified by faith in Christ is also being sanctified by faith in Christ. That's why Paul could say 
Don't be deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Faith in Christ starts with the discussion of righteousness. But it also involves self-control. Self-control. What is self-control? A, a synonym that is used in the King James Bible is the word temperance. Another synonym is, is self-government. Self-control is the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites, like sex, alcohol, food, money, etc. All of these sensual appetites, by the way, that our world sets before us and says, go for them, hold nothing back. Biblical self-control says, no, I'm not going to let those things rule me. I'd like to add something else about self-control before we look at some passages together, and that is that biblical self-control um, is not what the unbeliever exercises in, in his austerity in his severity to the flesh. There are plenty of unbelievers who have amazing self-control when it comes to exercise and diet and even managing budgets and such things. But biblical self-control is always Godward. It's always Christ-oriented. And that's why it's the fruit of the Spirit. So speaking of that, Look with me in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And start in verse 19. Paul writes here, Now the works of the flesh are evident, and these, these representative sins are going to sound familiar. The works of the flesh, which are evident, plainly seen, are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And someone might say, but that's no big deal because I've accepted Jesus in my heart. But Paul says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But in contrast to these works of the flesh, Paul gives us the fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And why is, there is, why is there no law against such things? Because they're righteous, including the virtue, the fruit of the Spirit of self-control. And I think it's ironic, don't you? Self-control. It's the fruit of the Spirit. We don't have it in ourselves to control ourselves for the right reasons. God has to give us the ability to exercise self-control, to have a mastery, government over our sensual appetites. We just don't have it in us the Holy Spirit has to bring it to us. And yet, we're called to do it. So, look with me next in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. 
it's the constant temptation of fallen human logic to assume that if something is the gift of God, therefore I'm off the hook. The Bible doesn't teach that. For example, the Bible teaches that saving faith is the gift of God. Repentance is the gift of God. And yet everyone is responsible to repent and believe the gospel. We're, we're not off the hook. And the same thing is true with self-control. It's the fruit of the Spirit, but we're responsible for it. Notice what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. For this very reason, Peter writes, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, a synonym for righteousness, by the way, and virtue with knowledge. So righteousness always goes hand in hand with understanding doctrine, having correct knowledge uh, from God's word. And supplement knowledge with self-control. Both of these things are true at the same time. On the one hand, self-control is the fruit of the Spirit. And on the other hand, we are responsible for it. And a really helpful verse to keep in mind on this dynamic is Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, where um, Paul writes... Uh, that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because it's God who is at work in you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And so when it comes to self-control, as we're obedient to Peter's command to add to our faith, dot, 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 self-control, and there's, there's some progress in doing that, then we look back and we see, ah, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for answering my prayers. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for enabling me to have some self-control. And then look with me in Titus chapter 2. Self-control is part of what God has saved us Four. Titus chapter 2 starting in verse 11 for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people by the way that's a great uh, Christmas passage it's a wonderful passage to Consider at the time of uh, celebrating the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus came into the world, he came to save his people from their sins. His name means salvation. When Jesus came into the world and he did everything that he did to secure the salvation of his people, then it's just what Paul says here. The grace of God has appeared in the person and work of Jesus Christ, bringing salvation for all people. And what has been the result? What are the practical implications of this salvation? What does it look like? Verse 12. This is what salvation entails. This is the practical outworking of it. This is what God does in the lives of those who are saved, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. You know, one thing that so many of us are alarmed about in our culture is how much our culture more and more is being given over to a passion-driven mentality. Basically, if your flesh desires it, you must have it. 
if you are passionate about it, it must be right for you. And nobody can tell you any differently. Nobody can get in your way. But you know, this is fallen human nature. There's nothing new under the sun. The same sort of uh, passionolatry, if you will, was alive and well during the Roman Empire. And that's why Christians who lived 2,000 years ago needed to be told to renounce worldly passions and by contrast, Peter says, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So notice, in the midst of this description of what salvation is all about practically, Peter includes self-control. Interpretation, application, God has saved us in order that we would live self-controlled lives. We would not be driven by the lusts of the flesh. We would not be driven by the passions of the world, our carnal appetites. Instead, we would be driven by a Holy Spirit-inspired desire to glorify God and to accurately reflect Him in a fallen world. Then, as Paul reasons before Felix and Drusilla, as he speaks about faith in Christ Jesus, he also talks about the coming judgment. So back in Acts chapter 24 and verse uh, 25, he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. And again, I can't help but just highlight a contrast with today's gospel. Because you hardly hear about judgment in contemporary, especially American evangelicalism. We, we hear a lot about the love of God. We hear a lot about uh, our lives being made better. We hear a lot about, which is true, <laughs> uh, we hear a lot uh, about uh, joy and satisfaction and having our desires fulfilled. Again, which is all true. But at the end of the day, when it comes right down to it, <clears throat> the main reason why people need to hear the gospel and repent of their sins and believe in Jesus is because there is a coming judgment. And I want to share with you a classic passage from the New the Old Testament, uh, Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, the last two verses in this book. <clears throat> Probably very familiar words to both Felix and Drusilla. And by the way, what Paul has already preached to them and reasoned with them about righteousness and self-control probably are just convicting them and cutting them to the quick. But then he really brings it home when he talks about judgment. So notice in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. I believe this is Solomon, uh, repentant, former backsliding Solomon, who wrote, the end of the matter. In other words, this is what life is all about. This is what everything is headed toward. All has been heard. Here it is. What's life all about? What's the conclusion of the whole matter? Fear God. Have a healthy respect and reverence towards your creator and judge. Fear God and keep his commandments. Actually obey God. Actually treat God as if he's God and you're not. 
And he says, for this is the whole duty of man. That's an amazing statement. Because if you would believe our modern day humanists, you would believe that the whole duty of man is self-actualization. It's about me feeling good about myself. It's about me achieving my goals, having vision and going towards that vision and whatever. Whatever I'm passionate about, fulfill your passion. And again, I'm not saying there's no truth in that, but notice that is not the whole duty of man. The whole duty of man is fear God and keep his commandments. And then that's the starting point for a proper identity and self-esteem, if you will. Well, so what? Maybe I can just take it or leave it. Who cares? Thank you for the advice, Solomon, but I have something else. I have another agenda. Something else is on my schedule. Solomon writes this. Why is this so important and urgent? For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. There's coming a day of accounting. We're all going to stand before our God. And our unrighteousness will be exposed and put on display in such a way that those who are without Christ are going to have their mouths stopped. No more uh, blame shifting. No more self-justifying. No more putting it off. No more arguing with God, but every mouth stopped and just pure, unadulterated, righteous, and holy, truth-telling judgment. And not just about big things that everybody talks about on the news, but even secret things, the hidden things of the heart, our motivations, our desires, what really makes us tick, whether good or evil. Because it is all either good or or evil. This is why we must preach the gospel. And judgment, I'm sure you know, is not an exclusively Old Testament theme. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verses 22 through 24, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. This is why it's so important to believe in Jesus. When you believe in Jesus, you pass from judgment. You pass from death to life and you are no longer condemned. There is nothing else to fear in terms of being condemned by a holy God. But still, as believers, we're told to live in light of the day of judgment. There's several verses, in fact. I'm just going to read one uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. In your own time, you can look up Hebrews 9 and verse 27, which says, by the way, it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment. But in 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul wrote uh, to Christians, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or good or evil. And just to set your conscience at ease, this judgment seat of Christ for believers, um, our salvation is not in question, but the validity of our faith is, are we sheep or are we goats? And our eternal rewards are certainly in question. The Apostles' Creed says that this Jesus 
who ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from that place of exaltation, Jesus shall come to judge the living and the dead. Judgment. That's what Jesus came to save us from. That's why we preach the gospel. That's why we're willing to be considered fools for Christ's sake. And that's why, if you're an unbeliever, you need to believe the gospel without delay as the negative response of Felix shows us. So this was Paul's message. He reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. How did Felix respond? Back in Acts chapter 24. Second half of verse 25. Felix was alarmed. <laughs> he didn't tune out Paul. He heard Paul. <clears throat> he was tracking Paul. But he was alarmed. Why was he alarmed? Because he was undone. He knew that this message of faith in Jesus Christ entailing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come completely pinned him down and had him all figured out. He was alarmed. So you would think he'd say, what must I do to be saved? Like the Philippian jailer did in it. Acts chapter 16, but no, that's not how Felix responded. He was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. He procrastinated. He didn't want to hear it. And that's not all. Verse 26. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. He was a greedy man. And in the Roman Empire, even though there were laws against bribery, bribery was nonetheless rampant in government. And so he apparently heard that Paul had some kind of access to funds. Remember that when Paul went to the temple, for the day of Pentecost, he, he brought some money for an offering. Maybe they caught wind of the fact that there were churches all over the known world who were contributing to Paul's ministry. Somehow or another, Felix assumed Paul had access to cash and cash Felix wanted. Didn't care about salvation. It was greedy. And then in verse 27, when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. What's this? Neglect. Neglect. The day of salvation for Felix had come and gone. God had drawn near to Felix and Drusilla in the preaching of the Apostle Paul. And there was some kind of conviction that they came under. That's why he was alarmed. But rather than doing what the gospel calls sinners like us to do, to turn from our sins and to receive the mercy and grace in Jesus Christ freely, Sent him away. Didn't want to hear it. Looked for money. And he waited for two years until he was plucked out of that situation by God's providence and that door of opportunity for Felix was closed. And so that's Felix's response. How are you going to respond? 
If you've not been a believer, if you, if you came through our doors not knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that he brings, do yourself a favor. Today, while it is called today, before your heart is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, before your heart is hardened so that you, you turn away and devote yourself to the urgency of things that this world says are so important, but they're only passing away. Today, come to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Become a Christian. Have faith in the Christ Jesus of the Bible. And then, then you could join the rest of us. This is where we... Uh, take Paul's message here and repackage it into three New Year's resolutions as we're on the first step here in the new year, 2021. Brothers and sisters, let us resolve as those who have faith in Christ to pursue practical righteousness in our lives. Let's pay attention to the Ten Commandments. Let's pay attention to the Sermon on the Mount and especially the Beatitudes. Let's pay attention to the fruit of the Spirit. Let's pay attention to the practical applications and instructions in the epistles of the New Testament. Pursue practical righteousness and let us resolve to grow in self-control. Let's not be ruled by the passions of the flesh, but ruled by King Jesus and his spirit dwelling within us. And let us live in light of the coming judgment. Let us realize that there's an appointment that we're all going to keep. And someday, for me and for you, all that matters is hearing that blessed voice, well done, good and faithful servant. God help us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the glorious message of faith in Christ Jesus. We pray that you will help us to live out our faith as those who truly know Jesus and love him, are walking with him, who know him. And we pray, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation for many. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.